Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Stuart. That very nice welcome. And, um, and hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm very easily distracted by noise, so I might, might do a lot of umming and ahhing this evening, so please excuse me in advance. Um, I think before I start, what I want to say is uh, I just want to commend my co-authors and I might embarrass Donna here a little bit because um, a few years ago we sat, I don't know where it was Donna, somewhere in Sydney and we agreed to write this book and we agreed it was necessary uh, as a historical document particularly as a piece of revisionist history countering the official American version of what went on in Fallujah and in Iraq more generally um, I've always respected Donna's work, uh, her courage, her ordinary courage in uh, Fallujah and in other parts of Iraq. Uh, she's one of Australia's leading activists and should be acknowledged as such and uh, has made a wonderful contribution to keeping alive the memory of what's happened to the people of Fallujah and elsewhere in Iraq. Uh, um, Ross Caputi, who is at the University of Massachusetts, uh, is also a remarkable person in the sense that as a young man he joined the US Marines he then went and served in Fallujah and was involved in the second battle of Fallujah and he had the misfortune to be following a senior officer around and, and he was able to see from various vantage points what happened in Fallujah for, uh, in front of his own eyes and the great trauma experienced by Ross was that he went to Iraq fully believing all the propaganda which was being wheeled out by the US military and political leadership. Most notably that the war in Iraq was a just war that it, and that the Battle of Fallujah was one of the most heroic struggles against an evil enemy since the Second World War. And what Ross saw in front of his own eyes, which I'm sure Donna will allude to, um, completely changed the way not only he viewed the war itself, but his view of the United States itself. What I want to start off today, um, I know in the subtitle of today's talk there's reference to Jim Mullen. Now, for those of you who saw Jim on um, Q&A last night, you know the sort of character we're dealing with. Um, somebody who finds evidence very difficult to deal with, um, which, which sort of raises some questions as the leader of a multinational force in Iraq, how he coped with a lot of information being presented before him. But that aside, when we think about Jim Mole, and, uh, and I think more importantly, the coalition of the willing to which Stuart referred, we're talking about a military force which essentially engaged in an illegal invasion of a foreign country, a sovereign state that posed no direct threat to the United States, Britain, or the other participants. The invasion itself was based on a series of lies and gross deceit, and it was, in breach of Section 4 of the Geneva Convention, a war of aggression mounted against a sovereign state. Throughout the war, we saw people who were resisting the illegal invasion and subsequent occupation referred to as insurgents, terrorists and others. In fact, a considerable number of these people were fighting as resistance fighters to an illegal occupation, and I think they should be viewed as such. It's no surprise that Fallujah, a city of 300,000 people, found itself in the, cry, in the crossfire of the United States and its coalition partners. Um, it's not unusual for the United States to mount wars. Since the World War II, approximately, the um, United States has been involved, along with other nations, in approximately 70 military uh, incursions into other countries. And the result has been death, destruction, and destabilization, most notably in, Middle East, in the Middle East. They've also, over, t over the time, they've supported coups, most notably the coup in Chile in the early 1970s, to upend a democratically elected government. And they've also offered money and support to death squads and various militia around the world. Sorry about my notes, by the way. The United States has been known, certainly over the course of the past century or so, as 
engaging in activities, military and otherwise, to secure its own economic and geopolitical interests. We know about the Monroe Doctrine, Doctrine in 1850, the Carter Doctrine in 1980, and the ramblings of the Project for the New American Century, all of which were designed to enhance and protect the, the economic and political interests of the United States across the globe. There are three things that characterize those doctrines. The first is a sense of exceptionalism. The sense that the United States has a divine right as a result of its military and political power to make incursions around the world to secure its economic and political interests. The notion of manifest destiny, which was, which was used as justification to spread American influence throughout the, the western provinces of, of North America, and the notion of global leadership, which was uh, expanded in the project of the New American Century. These notions, connected to a sense of divine right, have informed the actions of US political and um, economic elites over the course of uh, a century and a half. The other thing that distinguishes more recent incursion, recent incursions by the United States into other countries has been the doctrine of preemptive militarism. This is articulated most clearly in the Carter Doctrine, which actually talked about the right of the United States to make military incursions into other countries if they perceive those countries pose some kind of threat to their interests. And you can imagine that provided a lot of leeway for all sorts of actions around the world. But the other thing too, the one of the primary motives around the world, particularly when it comes to Iraq, was to secure its own economic interests. Naomi Klein has written a wonderful book called Shock Doctrine where she chronicles the actions of the United States in Iraq as a, as a way of imposing the, what the America's idea of liberal democracy in the Middle East and creating an axis with Israel. So we have, I won't go into the reasons why the war occurred, we know the official ones and we know the unofficial ones. But what I'm going to just talk about briefly is the invasion itself and what, what the early fallout was from that invasion. In 2003, 1st of May 2003, George W. Bush stood on, on the deck of an aircraft carrier and announced mission accomplished. Um, now with historical hindsight, what we know, it was just the beginning, not the end of a conflict. A uh, conflict that was to result in the life and the death of approximately, according to some sources, nearly a million people in Iraq and the destruction of an entire society. The, the, the provisional authority established under the watch of Paul Brenner was really, as many people refer to him as the Viceroy of, of Iraq, was really an attempt to restructure the Iraqi economy to make it fav favorable to, to the interests of the United States. What was very apparent from 2003 onwards, almost from the outset, and the interesting thing here is that when the American forces first went into Iraq, there was relative peace and calm. There wasn't necessarily an upsurge in violence. What actually occurred was that under the provisional authority, certain measures were taken to sorry, you waiting, sorry. Certain measures were taken to generate hostility in the local population. The most obvious one was the policy of debathification, um, where Paul Brenner ordered against the advice of many of his senior officials to remove all those people who had any alliances with the Ba'athist party. It's estimated that about 120,000 people lost their jobs, many of those senior military officers who subsequently were, went on to join Al-Qaeda and following them, ISIL. But the behavior of American soldiers around, soon aroused enormous amounts of discontent and anger amongst the uh, Fallujah population. In April 2003, a massacre occurred where a peaceful protest was fired on by American troops and 17 people were killed and many, many people injured. Uh, a few days later, uh, there was a protest in relation to those killings and more people were shot and injured and killed. But the real spark which gave rise to the so-called insurgency in Fallujah 
was the, the killing of four black war, war, Blackwater um, private contractors who were, in, 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 to all the intents, mercenaries. As you, you know the story by now, that four of these contracts were taken, uh, their bodies mutilated, they were killed, and their bodies burnt and hung on the bridge over the, the river Freites. It made for a very, very dramatic image in the United States, where photographs of this have become famous in the press. And what it gave rise to, I think, is an enormous reaction in America. You can imagine that being the case, given the graphic imagery. But it was a reaction based on what I would suggest would be a deeply held antipathy, uh, not only to the people of Fallujah and the so-called insurgents, but all the people of Fallujah. So as time went on, what actually happened was that the city itself and all its inhabitants became synonymous with those sorts of images. So when Bill, Bill O'Reilly, the former anchor of Fox News, um, a former anchor because of his, um, his, his antics in, in terms of sexually harassing women at Fox News, um, he regularly raged against Fallujah, the city. He said, Fallujah should not exist. It should have been leveled a long time ago, just leveled. That this town should have been made an example of years ago. Now, he was not the only one to talk in these terms, and as time went on, the invective, the anger, and the hatred became more and more heated. Most infamously expressed by a guy called Jack Wheeler, a former advisor to Ronald Reagan, who used the Roman term, uh, Fallujah Delenda Est, which is Fallujah destroyed. And I tried to look up what he actually, the context of that comment, and I couldn't actually find it again, but just, just off, in terms of my memory, my recall, what he called for was not simply that Fallujah should be destroyed, but it should be destroyed for, forever. All the men, women, and children should be eradicated, and the city, um, you know, taken off the map. What actually also occurred around this time was a narrative around the so-called insurgency and the presence of international terrorists in Fallujah. And the figure who dominated the airwaves in the United States was Abu Musab al-Zakawi, who was a Jordanian who was an operative with al-Qaeda. Um, there are, we suggest in the book, there are strong doubts whether al-Zakawi actually ever existed, whether he's actually even present in uh, Fallujah. The fact is that the, the governing council of Fallujah were extremely critical of al-Qaeda and subsequently of ISIL. And, and didn't want much to do with them. And the, uh, many people in Fallujah said that they they never witnessed the presence of Zakawi. But the important thing from the point of view of the United States, particularly in terms of engaging in its propaganda campaign, campaign was to equate the killings, the tortures, the, the bloodletting occasioned by people like Zakawi as being reflective of the entire Fallujah population. So increasingly, Fallujah became described in more and more graphic terms. And this was part of America's strategic communications, which not only sought to uh, convey a particular impression of Fallujah, but particularly for the American public. So they made sure that everything that was sent out in terms of propaganda was overseen by a sense of the military censors. So increasingly, they became known, the insurgents were described as a cancer, um, as uh, and Fallujah's a hotbed of terrorists, um, and the insurgents as evil monsters and barbarians. And you can, you can sort of imagine, um, what comes to mind here is the work of Edward Sa Said, and the, the notion of the othering of, of the Arab world, how these images dovetailed with that sense of othering and demonizing of a, of, a, of a particular people. In April and May of 2004, the Americans mounted a campaign to try and flush out these so-called insurgents and terrorists, Operation Vigilant Resolve. It was a lamentable failure, and much outrage was expressed not only in Iraq, but around the world in, ter in terms of some of the actions taken by the United States. And one of the grave errors, according to the US military, is that Al Jazeera, the TV station, 
was allowed to take footage of what was going on and that was filmed around and sent around the world. That, that, that error, in terms from the perspective of the US military, wasn't allowed to occur again. So when the second siege occurred, um, Operation Phantom Fury, in November of 2004, in, there were something in the order, I believe, of 91 embedded journalists, and no independent journalists were allowed in, and no photographers, no independent reporting of what went on. And on this occasion, the, um, the American forces, uh, of which 10,000 soldiers were involved, 850 British soldiers, and a significant contingent of Iraqi forces, who laid siege to Fallujah for uh, well over several weeks. About 2,000 so-called insurgents were killed, but equally significant, um, the estimates are between 800 and 1,000 civilians were killed. I'm going to leave it up to Donna to describe some of the things that happened in that second siege, because it was, according to the US military, the most significant battle since the Second World War. But from the vantage point of people in Fallujah, it was a gross exercise in bloodletting. Okay, let me just talk very briefly, if I may. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sorry I'm whizzing through this. Um, about Jim Mullen. Um, now, Andrew James Mullen was the um, head, headed up the multinational force in Iraq. Um, he was seconded to that position. It was an enormous responsibility. Um, and what he sought to do, um, certainly his book he makes this clear, running the war in Iraq, was to convey that the war was a just war. Um, to, to rid Iraq of terrorists and a potential threat to countries around the world. He, mounted, he oversaw three major operations in Fallujah, Najaf and Samara. The book itself I had looked through recently and I agree with the following review of that book. It is a highly sanitised version of what actually occurred under his command. Now I'm not going to talk about the atrocities which occurred in um, in the, during that, that second siege of Fallujah. But let me, because I think Donna will touch on that, let me just say that there were various people who were able to witness from one degree to another what actually occurred. Ross Caputi, Dar Jamal, Chris Doran and Tim Anderson went on to write a, a detailed review of the US operation. The Red Cross, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the UN, and critically, Chris Busby, a professor at the Ulster University, an epidemiologist, was able to demonstrate some of the very significant harms in terms of the use of depleted uranium and enriched uranium from weapons which um, we don't know precisely which weapons we use. Um, to discharge that, um, which caused grievous harm to the population of, um, of Fallujah. As I said, I'm not going to, at this point, just talk about all the atrocities, because I think um, there are so many of them, I've got pages and pages of them. When Jim Molan, when, his, um, when it was pointed out by um, journalists that he, and, and others that he'd posted some anti-Islamic trash material on Facebook, um, what looked like to prove it, um, there was a huge reaction to it. And he came out sort of um, flaying, with fist flaying. And he said this, he said, I spent one year in Iraq when I ran the war. I fought for Muslims in Iraq and many Iraqis were alive when I left because of the actions that I took. And for, that, and for those actions, he was awarded by the United States, he was awarded the Legion of Honor, and Australia, Australia awarded him the Distinguished Service Cross. Since then, since then of course, we've known, we've known really from 2004 many of the things that went on in Fallujah. Let's say Donald will outline those. To say there were human rights abuses would be understatement of the century. To say that there were illegal actions, to say that the, there was a free fire zone where people were allowed, where soldiers just sh shot gratuitously occurred, to say that there were mass killings of people occurred. And what we saw being acted out in Fallujah was a war of aggression, 
with all its consequences in terms of civilian harm. It was an illegal occupation of which Jim Molan was a part. And we witnessed many, many human rights abuses and violations. Let me just, I'd like to read a couple of things to you, if I may. Um, and I, because I think I totally agree with the commentary provided by these journalists and others. Um, in 2009, Lynn Allison and Tim Wright uh, from the Peace Organisation of Australia wrote the following. They said that the, political and, that the political and military leaders responsible for the loss and agony of those who suffered an illegal invasion and those who committed egregious crimes during the conflict must be brought to justice. Our collective failure to challenge their impunity sends a dangerous message to others who may be contemplating awful acts. Chris Doran, who wrote an excellent report with um, um, Tim, a sorry, Tim Anderson, um, said the following. Under the international legal doctrine of command responsibility, a commander-in-chief can be held liable if they knew or should have known that anyone under their command was committing war crimes and they failed to prevent them. The consistency and familiarity of the attacks at Najaf, Samara and Fallujah display a deliberate disregard for civilian life. By Molan's own admission, he was responsible for not only planning but also directing these attacks. It is not conceivable that Molan was unaware of the serious and well-documented accusations of atrocities being committed under his command. I would submit, based on the evidence that's been made available for many, many years now, and increasingly so, and just bear in mind, and Donald will make this point, no doubt, that the men, women and children of Fallujah and other cities around Iraq are still bearing the brunt um, and the suffering and the pain as a result of the actions of Jim Mole and, and his senior command uh, and under the, along with the political legitimation which they receive. I would actually say that there is a very strong case for Jim Mole to face justice and I think that justice is crucial in terms of assuring that similar actions don't happen in the future. There's no escaping his responsibility. He was one of the lead commanders and he was one of the chief architects for planning the assault on Fallujah and those two major cities. Thanks very much, if you don't.